Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. The most gratifying thing for me, and one of the challenges, admittedly, that we have in this field is that I don't have a great way to decide if any given medication that I recommend to a patient is going to work or not. It's very much trial and error. We don't have any way to test that in advance. But when it does work, that's one of the most gratifying things. People come in and we say, you know, we made that change a couple months ago and four weeks, six weeks after that, I noticed I was feeling a ton better. I was able to do more. I was able to spend more time with my family. Those are the kinds of things that I find people can do. Hi, I'm Angela DeGrassi, and I'm the host of the Psoriatic Arthritis Club a podcast from Creaky Joints and the Global Healthy Living Foundation, where we explore the ups and downs of managing and treating PSA, which for the uninitiated is an abbreviation for psoriatic arthritis. In this episode, we hear from Dr. Ruderman about an aspect that's crucial to every patient's journey, the relationship with their healthcare provider. Together, we'll explore the most effective ways to work with your doctor, how to communicate your concerns, hesitations, and hopes, and how to actively participate in decisions that could shape your treatment and ultimately your quality of life. Dr. Ruderman will also be answering questions from our patients from our first two episodes. Dr. Ruderman is a renowned professor of medicine and the Associate Chief of Clinical Affairs in the Division of Rheumatology at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. His clinical focus is on rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and spondyloarthritis. Dr. Rudman, thanks for returning for the second season of the podcast. Can you tell our listeners a little more about yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Ruderman. I am a rheumatologist at uh, Northwestern Medicine in Chicago, Northwestern University. I've been there for a bit more than 20 years. My practice is clinical rheumatology, and more specifically, I've had an interest and worked in psoriatic arthritis for many years. We have run a combined clinic with a dermatologist and myself to manage psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis for the better part of 20 years now. Wow, that's interesting. I can see how that background makes you a perfect guest for the Psoriatic Arthritis Club. So you mentioned you have dermatologists working alongside of you. What is the trickiest part about treating skin and joint symptoms? Well, I think the the tricky part is recognizing that different aspects of disease are important to different patients. And the way we try to think about it is that the people who come to see us in that clinic or the people that I see in my practice otherwise have psoriatic disease. Some of them have joint symptoms. Some of them have tendinitis. Some of them have bad skin disease. Some of them have nail changes. uh, Some of them may have back involvement. And regardless of what's going on, it's all part of the same disease. And one of the more challenging parts of the management is trying to work with the patient to figure out what issues are most important to them. For some people, it's the skin disease. For some people, it's the joint disease. Part of my job as a physician and as a rheumatologist is to make sure that they're thinking about all the implications. So somebody may say the joint disease doesn't bother me too much, but I may say, well, but down the road, you're going to regret that and say, well, I wish we had done more because you may be faced with damage to your joints that we didn't address early enough. Similarly for skin disease. So it's really a coordinated effort, and in particular in this clinic, it's a coordinated effort between myself, the dermatologist, and the patient to try to figure out what's the best management strategy for that particular person, taking into account all the aspects of disease that bother them the most. That's great to hear. So it sounds like it's really important that you collaborate with your patients based on what they find important, based on the symptoms that they experience and really impact their life. Absolutely. I mean, we talk a lot in medicine these days about shared decision-making and collaborative care, but this is one of the places where it's hugely important because there's just so many different aspects to consider. And psoriatic arthritis is a condition that people live with for a very long time. It's not uncommon for people to switch treatments several times throughout their life. How do you motivate patients to switch treatment when it's no longer working and What signs usually tell you that it might be time to make a change? That's a great question, Angela. It's different for different patients. So number one, I don't always have to motivate people. Many people say to me when they come in, this isn't working for me. I'm not doing as well as I was, or I'm having these issues that I wasn't dealing with before, and maybe it's time to make a change. 
it depends on what aspects are going on. So we may have somebody who has pretty solid control of their skin disease and pretty good control of their joint disease. And they come in and say, you know, my joints are still doing great, but my skin has been getting a lot worse in the last six months. What can we do? Or the opposite. They may say, my skin's been well controlled, but I'm having more and more joint pain. And for treatments that are intermittent, they may say, well, it's not lasting as long as it did. And I'm starting to flare before I'm due for my next shot or my next infusion or whatever it is that they're being treated with. And so all of that gets kind of rolled into the discussion to say, okay, what's not going well? What do we need to address? And can we do that by, in many cases, tweaking what we're doing now? Can we adjust the dose of your medicine? Can we add something else to get that extra little bit? Or is it time to make a change altogether? And the challenge when you make a change is there are no certainties in this disease. And so I can switch to another medication that I would say, well, that's likely to work better, but I don't know that for sure. And there's no good way to test that in advance until we start the medicine and see if it works. And so sometimes those are challenging decisions. And it really comes down to a real discussion between myself, the dermatologist, and the patient to figure out what's the best approach for them. Right. That sounds good. And I know that there's so many things to be taken into consideration when someone is deciding what medication to take. What would you say to a patient who's hesitant to try a treatment out of fear of side effects? Yeah, that can be a challenge. And I think what helps is to talk through the potential side effects and to talk through the real risk of those side effects. So one of the problems is people may see a medication advertised on TV, for example, and you know, at the end of all those commercials, they list all of the really horrible things that can happen when you take the medicine. And the problem is they're not listed in any sort of context. So the narrator will say, and we have to warn you, if you take this medicine, you could have A, B, C, D, E, and F, and possibly even death. And the answer sometimes is that, well, those things are possible, but they're really unlikely. And so one of the things we talk about is what's the true risk of those side effects? How likely is it that any individual patient is likely to have any of those problems? And more importantly, can we identify that when it's starting to happen? And that's a big part of the discussion to say, here are the risks, here are the possible side effects. But it's not like all of a sudden you're going to go from zero to 60 and that one day you're going to be totally fine. The next day you're going to be flat in bed with all these problems. So a lot of times we talk about, well, what are the warning signs? What are the things we can look for? What can we monitor, lab test, things like that to say, well, these side effects are maybe starting and maybe we need to adjust the dose or think about switching meds. So it's really a discussion about what's the real risk and how likely are these things to happen. Very good. We know that FaceTime with your doctor can be short and you can wait months for an appointment and then it goes by very fast. What are some key things that you would like patients with PSA to know about making the most out of their limited time with their rheumatologist? So tell us if there's anything they can do to prepare for an appointment or any information that they can share with you that you find helpful. I think they go hand in hand. And so I think to make the most of the appointment, and as you said, the appointments can be short, they may be far apart. So it's often helpful for a patient to think about what's going on the day before, to take a few minutes and think about how have they been doing? What issues have they been having? Are they having more symptoms that they weren't having previously? What are those symptoms? Are they joints? Are they skin? Are they back problems? Whatever it is, think about any side effects they've been having. Think about the medicine that they're taking. Is it continuing to work consistently or are they going up and down? Are they having flares when they're due for a dose? Does it work as well as it did previously? Those are the kinds of things that are helpful to come in with because then I know from the beginning, where are we starting from? What, what's happening? What's the current situation? Those are the questions I'm going to ask anyhow, but it's often helpful if people think about it in advance because then you don't forget about it. I mean, what happens a lot is we go through a whole visit and somebody says, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you that I've been having this particular issue. And then we got to go back and maybe that was important as we were making some decisions earlier in the visit or worse, they leave and they remember something the next day and they say, oh, I wish I told them that. And then they'll send me a message. But at that point, it's not the same as sitting there in person and working together to address what's going on. So I think mostly it's really about preparing ahead of time by just thinking about what's your current state, what's happening, 
Is the medicine working? Are you having any side effects? Or do you feel like your disease is being adequately addressed? Or do you feel like there are parts of it that aren't being addressed? And those are the things we want to focus on during the visit. That's really helpful. I know that all of us are really susceptible to forgetting things, even if they are really important in the moment. You just might not be thinking about it. Actually, at GHLF, we have created an arthritis registry that's also an app where patients can track their symptoms and treatments, then share reports with their rheumatologists. It's called Arthritis Power. Would you find something like that helpful uh, from your perspective as a rheumatologist? If someone came in that showed, for example, you know, how well they were sleeping and, you know, when they had a flare and what those symptoms were, if you saw items like that over time in a nice little report, would that be something that might be interesting to you? That sort of thing is very helpful to know what's been happening. Remember, I may see a patient every three months or every six months, and it's hard sometimes because even if they're preparing for the visit, as we just talked about, recall isn't great. And so people may think about how they've been doing in the last two weeks, but maybe two months ago, they actually had a bad time and they didn't get a chance to let me know and things are settled down. But I need to be aware of that because it really affects how well I think they're doing with their treatment. So an app like that that tracks all that is great. I don't know that it's critical to say, well, on Tuesday I was this, and on Wednesday I was this, and on Thursday I was this, you know, that sort of very granular level. But the big picture level of, you know, are you doing well? Are you having periods when you're not doing well? Are you having periods when you're doing better? And importantly, what's different at the times when you're not doing well? Did you miss a dose? Did you change a medicine recently and it wasn't working as well for you? Did you add a different medicine for another disease that might be interacting with what you're taking for your arthritis? Those are all really important. And to get them down in an app like that is helpful. If you're a note taker, that's something you can just take notes on. But those pieces of information about what happens between the visits can be very useful in making the right decisions in terms of managing your disease. Those are great questions to ask yourself to measure how you're doing. Managing your condition is an individual journey, and what works for one person might not work for another. For example, take things like diet and exercise. Are there lifestyle changes that you might suggest to patients with psoriatic arthritis that they might practice in their day-to-day -day life that could complement their treatment? And lifestyle changes could include anything that deal with nutrition, sleep, movement, or mental health. It's a great question, Angela. I think that... Yes, all of those things come into play. Physical activity is hugely important. So people talk a lot about exercise. I try to focus more about being active. For some people, exercise is kind of a scary word. And I don't always necessarily focus on saying you have to get this many minutes or hours of exercise in a day or a week. But more that you're staying active, staying, continuing to move, continuing to use your body. One thing I do find for some people, not everybody, but for some people, there's a concern that if they are active, they may cause more damage to their joints. And I really try to stress with people that there's very little that you can actually do physically that's going to make your psoriatic arthritis worse. It may make symptoms a little bit worse, and you may have to modify the kinds of activity you do if it's aggravating some of your symptoms or if it's aggravating one particular joint. But you're not going to really cause damage to that joint that you need to fear that being active is something you'll regret later. And it actually is more helpful than harmful. Other things, sleep is really important. Getting good, regular quality sleep certainly impacts a lot of the disease, certainly impacts a lot of the pain that people have. Diet is a little bit more challenging. I think it's important to get a good, balanced, healthy diet. That certainly keeps you healthy in many ways. There are aspects of diet that may impact psoriatic arthritis or other types of arthritis. The challenge is that that is probably very individual. And there is a lot of work going on right now trying to understand the role of diet in psoriatic arthritis and whether certain foods make things worse, certain foods make things better. I try to steer people away from a particular diet that, you know, has been said works for everybody because nothing ever works for everybody. And so if there are foods that make your symptoms worse, then it makes a lot of sense to stay away from those things. If there are foods that seem to make you feel better, those are fine. Weight loss, getting to a good, healthy weight is very important. And there is some research and some data in psoriatic arthritis that says losing weight can improve symptoms. It makes some sense. The more weight you lose, the less stress you're going to put on your joints, so they won't bother you as much. But I don't focus on it to the point of making people feel 
bad about their weight. I don't want people to feel like they're not doing what they need to do, but I think it, it can become an important part of the overall management of your disease and managing all the symptoms that you have. Right. And we know that being active is something that people want to get back to, getting back to activities they might have done before. But we also know that PSA comes with symptoms such as fatigue and joint pain. What would you say to someone that has concerns or challenges with those uh, symptoms that get in the way of activity? It's a great question. And I think the first thing I tell people, especially if they haven't been very active, is to start slow. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients come in and say, I started in a new exercise program, but I quit after three days because the next day I was miserable and I couldn't get out of bed. And then when I break down and say, well, what were you doing? All of a sudden they're doing an hour of vigorous exercise a day where they weren't doing anything before. And it makes sense that they're going to feel worse. So if you haven't done a lot of exercise, if that's not part of your routine, it's important to add it, but it may be as simple as don't start walking five miles a day if you've never been walking. Start by walking around the block twice and make sure that goes okay. And then a little longer the next day and try to build up to where you need to be. Fatigue is a challenge and there's no question that people have a lot of fatigue, especially when their disease is very active. One of the things that definitely impacts fatigue is the amount and the quality of sleep that you get. And physical activity actually helps that. So people who are more active get better sleep at night and they're potentially less fatigued the next day. It can sound a little counterintuitive. The more you do, the less fatigued you are. But in fact, that's what happens in the real world. The more active you are, the better you sleep at night, not necessarily so much in hours, but the quality of your sleep. And you're going to have less fatigue the next day and be able to do more the next day. So I think the keys are staying active. Don't do too much too quickly. So whatever changes you make, do them slowly and focus on a balance between activity during the day and getting good solid sleep at night. That's really great advice. I like that. What are some changes that you've seen in patients who have started medication for their first time? And what has this medication allowed them to do? You know, it depends on the medication. The most gratifying thing for me, and one of the challenges, admittedly, was that I don't have a great way to decide if any given medication that I recommend to a patient is going to work or not. It's very much trial and error. We don't have any way to test that in advance. But when it does work, that's one of the most gratifying things. And I, people come in and they say, you know, we made that change a couple months ago and four weeks, six weeks after that, because it's never overnight, but after a few weeks, I noticed I was feeling a ton better. I was able to do more. I was able to spend more time with my family. I was able to go to my kids' soccer games that I couldn't do before because I just didn't feel up to it. Those are the kinds of things that I find people can do. It's not so much saying they don't come back and say, oh, I suddenly ran a half marathon last week when I wasn't able to walk six months ago, but more like I can do the kinds of things in my life that I really want to do every day. And I just didn't feel up to it because of my arthritis. And now that it's controlled, I can get back to those things. And those are gains that we know are really important to people is just really being able to live their life and participate in their usual daily activities without pain and without major fatigue. Absolutely. And these days, you know, when I see somebody for the first time or when I start working with them to try to find good treatment for them, I can tell them that my goal is to make you feel like you don't have this disease. I mean, you still do. I mean, once you've got psoriatic arthritis, it's with you. It's not, we don't have a cure yet. We can't make it go away. But my goal is to get you to a point where you don't feel like it's part of your life anymore, that it's well controlled with the medication and you're back to what you used to do before the arthritis got in your way. I imagine that must be something really comforting for a patient to hear in your office. I really like that. Thank you for sharing. Are there any other therapies or non-pharmaceutical treatments that you would recommend to a patient with PSA? It depends on what else is going on in their life, but I think for some people, and not for everybody, but for some people, physical therapy can be very helpful, particularly for people who've been relatively sedentary or had challenges doing the things they want to do because their arthritis has been so active. A lot of times people come in and ask me about physical therapy, and the first thing I'll tell them is I don't want to do that until we can get your disease under control, because then you're pretty much wasting your time. You're spending time with a therapist trying to do all this exercise, but you're hurting, so you can't really do it. So our first focus is getting disease under control as much as we can. 
But at that point, for many people who've been pretty sedentary, who haven't been terribly active, sometimes spending some time with a physical therapist is what it takes to get them moving again. Some people do it very well on their own, and they say, you know, I don't need that. I'm okay. I know the kinds of things I need to do. I've done it before. I'm going to get back to it. But for many people, working with a physical therapist is a good way to kind of get back to the kinds of activities that you used to do but haven't been able to do for some time. And sometimes it takes the barriers out of the way to getting there. Great. So physical therapy, that is something that you would suggest to someone with PSA. Thank you. So we have one more question. What is something that you wish all PSA patients knew about living with this condition? That's a really good question. I hope I didn't stump you. (laughs) No, no. I guess probably my answer to that question is they need to know that everybody's individual. And perhaps in many ways more so for this disease than a lot of the other things I see in rheumatology where the problem is just joints. Here it's joints, it's skin, it's tendons, it's lower back, it's nail changes. And I think people say, well, how do people usually respond? Or am I responding the way most people do? And the answer is, there are no most people. Everybody's individual. And I want people to know that they need to think about their disease. They need to think about how it affects them personally, what issues they struggle with and focus on addressing those rather than trying to think about what's the one treatment that's going to work for everybody, because there is no treatment that works for everybody. And I think the corollary to that is once you understand that, I need people to sometimes be patient because not every treatment is going to work when we first started. And sometimes it may take two or three tries. I wish it didn't. I wish we had a good way to decide up front which treatment is right for which patient. But because we don't, sometimes it takes two or three tries to get it right. We almost always do, and that's another thing I want people to know, is that stick with it. It's unlikely that you're going to be faced with a situation where you just can't get better, but sometimes it may take a little while to find the right balance for you, the right medication or combination of medicines that are going to get your disease under control and make you feel better and get back to your life. That's so true. We've had patients tell us that they blame themselves when a treatment stops working. Can you reiterate that it's not their fault if a treatment doesn't work? Absolutely not. I mean, that's the problem. We don't know how to decide which treatment's going to work for any individual patient. We have clinical trials. Whenever any drug is approved, there's a clinical trial. And the outcome of the clinical trial typically says, well, you know, 60% of people who were on the medicine did better and only 10% of the people who were on placebo. So that sounds great. But that's 60%. It's not 100%. So not everybody's going to respond to every medicine. And it's not your fault. It's not anything you did wrong. It's just the response is individual. And what works for one person may work less well for somebody else. And it really just becomes a challenge to sort of work through the options and come up with the ones that are going to work for you. Before we conclude, our other guests on the podcast that you may have heard in episode one and two, Ashley and John both have questions for you. Ashley, go right ahead. So, doctor, I am wondering if there is any upcoming research or treatments that are being pursued specifically for the inflammation aspect in the joints for psoriatic arthritis. And I'm not looking for an overall body suppression. I'm looking for something very targeted to the psoriatic arthritis. That's a great question, Ashley. Honestly, though, I do think it goes hand in hand. And when you have psoriatic arthritis, you don't just have inflammation in your joints. It is your whole body. It is a systemic disease. And while there are some medications that specifically work on joints, many medications work on the way the disease affects you more globally. And that's not always a bad thing if there are medications that have few or a reasonable amount of side effects. So there are a lot of upcoming therapies. And one of the nice things about a lot of the treatments we've had, the ones that have come aboard in the last 10 or 15 years, is that they seem to work very well for both skin disease and for joint disease. A lot of the research now is focused on trying to find the right treatment for the right person. There are some things that work better for joint symptoms and some things that work better for skin disease and trying to identify which of those are going to be better for anybody in particular. And so there are new targets coming out, new things to target to try to treat the disease. There are new ways of choosing the right treatment for the disease. And increasingly, 
we're beginning to look at combinations of treatment, but not just in the way we've done it in the past, which is to say, well, this drug isn't working, so we'll add this other drug and see if now things are better. They're much more tailored combinations, thinking about using combinations of medications that work together to give you a better response than either one would individually. So I think those are the things that are coming in line. And we've made huge strides in managing this disease in the last 20 years. And I think the next 10 or 20 years, it's going to be a whole new world as well. Ashley always asks such great questions. And that was a really good answer. Now, our guest, John, has a question that may be a common concern among patients who may experience a decline in effectiveness of their treatment plan. John, what is your question for Dr. Ruderman? Hi there. The question I have for you is for patients that may be on a treatment plan that is, you know, losing its effectiveness. Maybe the symptoms are coming back or, you know, worsening and, you know, there is a concern. There may need to be a medication switch. What is your strategy in handling that situation and what's kind of your plan treatment-wise to address that? That's a great question, John. And I think that the way I approach it, first and foremost, is to recognize that there's no right answer. So if somebody's not doing well, there are a number of things we can do, and there's no single thing that's the best thing for everybody, or even for any individual patient. There are always options. There are always choices. And so if I have a strategy, the strategy is to engage the patient, to talk to them about what isn't going well, what would they like to see improve, and then talk through options. Sometimes the option is to add something else onto what they're taking now. For example, if I have somebody who has had bad psoriasis in the past, but their skin disease is very well controlled on the current regimen and their current medication, but their joints are doing worse, before I switch altogether, we talk about what can we add that's going to get their joints under control while still maintaining control of their skin disease. If the joints and the skin aren't doing well, then we start to talk about, well, what could we change to to address everything? So there are always choices, and the choices range from making minor changes to try to add something on to saying, well, we need to start all over and try another medication to see if that works better for you. It's always important to go into that with eyes open. And there are times when it's clear you have to make a change. Things are just not going well. You're just not doing well. And we need to come up with a different option, a different medication. But sometimes you're almost there. You're 90% better. And then I do worry, and we have this conversation, I do worry that if we make a switch, perhaps you'll actually do worse because the new medication may not be as good as what you're on. And those are the scenarios where maybe adding something or making slight changes in dose might be more effective or more appropriate than making a wholesale change of medicine. So I guess the best strategy is conversation and making sure that we're making decisions that really are the right decision for that particular person. Dr. Ruderman, I really love how you always interject with uh, some kind of collaboration with the patient. So I think that really means a lot to a lot of people that their individual circumstance and their past a medication history and symptom history is always taken into consideration. It's really great to hear and also very comforting. Now, I've enjoyed talking to you, Angela, and I think that what you said is absolutely right. You know, the treatment of psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis in general is a collaborative effort. And part of that collaboration is myself as the rheumatologist, the dermatologist who's involved, and the patient. And no single one of us is really driving the decision making. The three of us have to really coordinate to make sure that we come up with the best approach. Thank you for all those fantastic answers. That's it for the Psoriatic Arthritis Club. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed hearing from our guest, Dr. Ruderman. And if you haven't already, make sure to check out our first season, where we share more incredible stories that inspired and touched the hearts of our community. You can find all episodes on our platform. This podcast was made possible with support from AbbVie. For more information and stories from other PSA patients like you, subscribe to the Psoriatic Arthritis Club or visit psoriaticarthritisclub.org. You can also visit creakyjoints.org for the latest information and news about living better with PSA. If you like what you've heard, be sure to rate our podcast, write a positive review, and spread the word by sharing with your friends and family. It'll help more people like you find us. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.